On 15th August, 11 men walked out of Gothra jail in Gujarat. 20 years ago, during the 2002 post-Gothra riots, these men had gang-raped Bilkis Bano and raped and murdered several of her family members. Earlier this week, when they were released from jail, visuals emerged of relatives greeting them with sweets and charan sparsh, touching their feet for their blessings. Of course, a debate has since ensued on how 11 rapists walked out of jail and also on the propriety of the state government's decision to release them. We had explained the remission policy based on which Gujarat government decided to release them. We would be sharing the link to that video and the article in description below. Today, I am going to explain to you what the case is, what happened in those 20 years from 2002 to now, that is 2022, and what legal options does Bilkis Bano have now. But let me start with the question, who is Bilkis Bano? Bilkis Bano's case was perhaps one of the most brutal of the 2002 Gujarat riots cases. According to Bano, 14 members of her family were killed by a mob at Gujarat's Randhikpur village and here's what happened. Now in February 2002, thousands of Karseviks travelled from Gujarat to Ayodhya to participate in the inauguration of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad's 100-day Purnahuti Maha Yagna. This event was a part of the VHP's agenda to build a Ram temple on the disputed Babri Masjid site. On 27 February 2002, between 7.40 a.m. and 7.50 a.m., the train, Sabarmati Express, arrived at Gothra. As it was just about to leave the station, someone pulled the emergency chain, bringing the train to a halt. A coach of the Sabarmati Express, coach S6, was set ablaze, set on fire, and 59 passengers travelling in that coach were charred to death. The victims included 27 women and 10 children. Injuries were suffered by another 48 passengers in the train and this triggered one of the worst communal riots witnessed in Gujarat and across the country. The next day, about 50 kilometers away from Gothra, Bilkis Bano's village Randhikpur witnessed incidents of arson and looting. Muslims in the village began fleeing, of course, and Bano's family was also on the run, going from village to village in search of safety. However, on 3rd March, their luck ran out. They were attacked by several men who came in two white vehicles. According to Bilkis, they were carrying swords, lathis and sickles in their hands and when they saw Bilkis and her family, as per the Bombay High Court judgment, Bilkis alleged that they shouted, Musalmano ko maro, kill the Muslims. From the people who attacked them, Bilkis Banu identified all the 12 accused. She also alleged that one of the accused, Shailesh Chimanlal Bhatt, pulled Banu's three-year-old daughter Saleha from her arms and smashed her on the ground. The men then went on to rape Bano and all the other women uh, of her family. Bano was unconscious for several hours after the incident. When she regained uh, consciousness, she crawled up a hilltop and hid there. The next day, she climbed down the hill from the other side and met a tribal woman who helped Bano with some clothes and later became a prosecution witness in the case as well. Bano then saw a vehicle with two persons, uh, two people in uniform and requested them to take her someplace safe. The prosecution said that Bano was brought to Limkheda police station where she registered an FIR, but even this FIR was not correctly uh, recorded. In the FIR, there was no mention of her being raped and even though Bano had recognized all the 12 accused, the FIR said that she did not know any of the accused. This police officer who recorded her FIR, in fact, was also held guilty for incorrect, incorrectly recording it and was sentenced to two years imprisonment or later. But this is just the start of Bano's 20-year-long journey for justice. The Gujarat police submitted a report for closing the case in February 2003 and the court also accepted this report. However, Bano did not give up. With the help of the National Human Rights Commission, she approached the Supreme Court demanding that the closure report be set aside and that her case should be investigated by the CBI instead. The Supreme Court allowed this petition and transferred the case from Gujarat police to the CBI. CBI took over the investigation in January 2004. It conducted a very detailed probe and even exhumed bodies of those killed to conduct a post-mortem on them. The CBI filed a charge sheet in the case in April 2004 and charges were framed against 12 accused who Bano had named for various offences including gang rape and murder and rioting. 
charges were framed against eight more people which included police officers and doctors for incorrectly uh, framing uh, records like the FIR and for tampering with evidence. In 2004, Banu once again petitioned the Supreme Court to move the trial from Gujarat to Mumbai, claiming that um, witnesses were being threatened and there was a threat of influence on the witnesses. And so in August 2004, the case was shifted to Mumbai. Finally, in 2008, the trial court convicted 13 people. 12 of these men were convicted for gang rape, murder and rioting. Here are the names of those 12 men. They were all awarded life imprisonment. The 13th man was the police officer, like I mentioned earlier, who recorded the FIR incorrectly and was held guilty. These convicts filed appeals challenging their conviction and sentence, of course, in the Bombay High Court. The CBI also filed appeals demanding death penalty for three of the accused. Accused number one, Jaswant Bhai Chatur Bhai Nai, accused number two, Govind Bhai Nai, and accused number four, Shailesh Chimanlal Bhatt. The CBI also appealed against the acquittal of eight accused, which included doctors and police officers, like I mentioned, for tampering with evidence and uh, framing incorrect records. So six of these people out of the eight people who were acquitted were police officers of the Limkhera police station who played different roles in the initial investigation. The CBI had in fact during its probe found that these Limkhera police officers were not only negligent, but they also deliberately tried to screen the offenders caused disappearance of the evidence and had provided false information to screen these people uh, to save them. The remaining two out of these eight who were acquitted were doctors who had carried out post-mortem on seven dead bodies. Uh, in fact, as per the Bombay High Court judgment, it noted that even though it was apparent that the dead bodies were victims of uh, assault and violence and uh, a whitish liquid was seen coming out of uh, the private parts of some of the female dead bodies. The two doctors did not collect all the necessary samples. Now, while they were initially acquitted by the trial court, the Bombay High Court reversed their acquittal and held them guilty of tampering of evidence and framing incorrect records. The Bombay High Court also went on to uphold the convic conviction of the 12 uh, men uh, who were convicted of gang rape and murder. Years later, in April 2019, the Supreme Court also ordered the Gujarat government to provide Banu with a compensation of Rs 50 lakhs, a government job and accommodation. Now, just to let you know, one of the accused who was amongst the 12 convicted of rape and murder, as well as the police officer who recorded the FIR incorrectly, both of these convicts passed away while the appeal before the High Court was pending. So, in total, 11 people were currently on life term in this case and these were the 11 who were released last week. Now, why were they released? Because Section 433 of the Code of Criminal Procedure allows governments to commute an imprisonment for life to imprisonment of 14 years. Just to explain, life imprisonment actually means living in jail for the rest of your life. But it permits, the law permits the union and state governments uh, to reduce a person's life sentence to 14 years of jail term. That's what remission essentially means also. It means reducing the amount of sentence without changing its character. So, for example, two years rigorous imprisonment can be changed to one year rigorous imprisonment. But this is a discretion that the government has. Section 433A of the CRPC places a restriction on these powers of remission as well. It says that where a person has been given a life sentence for a crime which has death penalty as one of the possible punishments, then such a person shall not be released from prison unless he has served at least 14 years in jail. So, that's when the... Um, the privilege of remission can arise once these convicts have spent at least 14 years in jail. Now, state governments set up a sentence review board to exercise their powers under Section 432 of the CRPC. But what are the grounds on which remission is granted? As per the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has held that states cannot exercise the power of remission arbitrarily and must follow due process. While the policy varies from state to state, broadly the grounds for remission considered by the board are the same. In fact, in the year 2000, the Supreme Court laid down five grounds on which remission is considered. You can see these grounds on your screen right now. Now, in this case, I'm sure you've heard about the arguments and counter arguments on whether the 11 convicts were released under the right policy. The Gujarat government had a two-page circular in 1992 on remission. You can see this circular on its screens right now. This circular didn't say much. It just pertained to early release of life convicts who had served 14 years of jail time on and after 18 December 1978. 
the circular entitled such cases to being considered for remission and it made it the duty of the inspector general of prisons to initiate these uh, proceedings for early release of convicts it just laid down the procedure for remission but didn't mention any exceptions or factors that needed to be considered when granting remission now this um, policy or circular whatever you want to call it evolved through judicial policy and supreme court judgments like i mentioned earlier but basically this was the policy which was used to release the convicts in bilkis bano case but there's another policy which is more recent the latest policy in gujarat was passed in january 2014 and it bars the government from granting remission or premature release to prisoners convicted for a crime that was investigated by the cbi and prisoners convicted for murder with rape or gang rape therefore if the application of the convicts in the bilkis bano case were considered under the new policy the state government would have been barred by its own policy from releasing them so why was the 1992 policy followed because the supreme court said so and not the first time the supreme court has ruled in the past that the policy which is in effect at the time of conviction should be the one that should apply in this case one of the convicts radesham bhagwan das shah also known as lala vakil approached the supreme court in march this year seeking a direction to the gujarat government to consider his application for premature release he pointed out how the convicts in this case had already spent over 15 years in jail and so were eligible for remission the supreme court passed an order on 13th may this year on two points Firstly it said that the Gujarat government should consider the remission and not the Maharashtra government there was some confusion here because the conviction happened in Maharashtra but the supreme court said that since the crime was committed in Gujarat the Gujarat government should consider the applications second the supreme court said that their application would be considered under the state government's 1992 policy for state remission and premature release of prisoners it said that this was of course because premature release needs to be considered on the basis of the policy prevalent on the date of conviction which is settled law in that it then directed the gujarat government to consider shah's application and application of all these convicts for premature release within a period of 2 months according to the applicable policy which was the 1992 policy but the onus here lied on the jail advisory committee that decided the remission application to apply the conditions laid down by the supreme court on grant of remission the 1992 policy says that before granting remission to life convicts the state government should take into account um the report of the advisory board the report of the in inspector general and the behavior of the prisoner in jail but since this decision came to light the composition of the jail advisory board in bilkis banos case set up to look into this remission has also sparked a row after former union minister p chidambaram of congress and some others flagged that the committee included two bjp mlas of gujarat reports have also suggested that the 10 member committee also had three more bjp office bearers along with two mlas now um apart from all of this what recourse does banu have at this point now the supreme court has in the past noted that courts have limited powers to review remission orders advocate shobha gupta who represented bilkis banu at the supreme court earlier has also told the media that challenging this order would be like challenging any other government order it could be done in the high court or the supreme court so it is now up to bilkis banu on whether she wants to take on another legal fight for now in her first reaction to the release of the convicts banu said that the decision and i quote has taken from me my peace and shaken my faith in justice unquote she said that the decision left her numb and bereft of any words her brief statement ended with the words and i quote i appeal to the gujarat government please undo this harm give me back my right to live without fear and in peace please ensure that my family and i are kept safe unquote this is apurva mandhani for the print for more such videos do subscribe to our youtube channel and follow us on twitter instagram and facebook